الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد. Brothers and sisters, as we all know that in the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal told us we are the best nation. There is no nation better than this nation, the nation of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When Allah Azza wa Jal said, "Kuntum khair ummatin ukhrijat fi nasi ta'muruna bil ma'arufi wa tanhuna an al munkar wa tu'minuna billah." Allah Subhanahu wa Taala told us that we are a people, a nation. We are the best nation that has been taken out, that has been raised and brought out for mankind. We're the best nation brought out for mankind. Why? Because we enjoin good. We tell people, this is right. Do this. And we forbid evil. We tell them, this is wrong. Don't do this. And we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's important that you know that us being the best nation is not an unqualified status. It's not something that we get by virtue of just being born. In this ummah No Umar ibn Khattab Radiallahu anhu Said the khayriya The greatness of this ummah Is connected To that thing Which Allah mentioned in the verse Which is To enjoin good And forbid evil In fact To not enjoy good Forbid evil And to do the opposite of it Is actually a characteristic Of the hypocrites When Allah Azza wa Jal He said Al-munafiquna wal-munafiqat Ba'duhum min ba'd Ya'muruna bil-munkar Wa yanhawna anil ma'ruf The hypocrites They don't enjoy good And forbid evil Rather they enjoy evil And forbid good They tell you Do the evil And, don't, and, and they tell you stay away, from, stay away from the good For example The person wants to Enjoy the sunnah The people will say Ah why are you always Talking about the sunnah they, they forbid the good If someone's refuting evil They say, why are you refuting the evil? They forbid good And they enjoin evil For example, they say, let's unite with the innovators Let's, you know, let's get involved in democracy And let's water down our religion And let's reform Islam So they enjoin evil And they forbid good Whereas the Muslims enjoin good And they forbid the evil but I'm sure it's safe to say that we as a ummah have lost this great characteristic of enjoining good and forbidding evil. Not as a whole, alhamdulillah, there's always khair in the ummah. But we have become significantly deficient in that which made us the best ummah. And because of that, we've even lost our status in the world. We were once a nation with strength on the earth and our people were respected. But now Muslim blood runs cheap. We're constantly raising money for Syria, for Kashmir, for this, for that, for Muslims struggling all around the world. And we've lost our strength. And even when we are living in countries in the West, we're humiliated. Look in France, they've just banned the, the hijab for girls in school, for students in university. Mothers are not even allowed to wear the hijab to pick up their school, from, their kids from school. This has come to us also because we stopped enjoying good and forbidding evil. Allah Azza wa Jal, He said, fil ard. The ones that Allah He gives establishment on the earth, He makes them strong on the earth, He gives them victory on the earth, are what? The ones who aqamu salah, they establish the prayer. Wa atahu zakat, they give the zakat. Wa amaru bil ma'ruf, they enjoy the good. And what do they do? anil munkar, they forbid the evil. They forbid the evil. The ones who forbid the evil, these are the ones who Allah Azza wa Jal, he, he gives them strength from the earth. Those who enjoy good and forbid the evil. So you can see this is something that made us the best ummah. Not doing it and doing the opposite is a characteristic of the hypocrites who are the worst of the people inside the hellfire. They will have the lowest place in the hellfire. And also coming back to enjoying good and forbidding evil will bring our ummah back to the greatness that it once had. Now my brothers and sisters, the ummah, go, go, it, it, it's going to go back to greatness based on individuals. You see, some people have a top-down uh, look at life. They want to change the ummah by changing the government. Or they want to try and change the ummah as a whole. But the way that the ummah changes is through individuals. The Prophet ﷺ was told, even if you put what? The sun in my right hand and the moon in my left. I'm not going to give up this message. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The authenticity of the narration is, correct, is, 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 is questioned But they offered the Prophet ﷺ some kingdom They said we'll make you our king Just give up this message He had the chance to go straight to the top in politics And take over Okay But he ﷺ didn't Because that doesn't make change You, you can't that, You know you're forcing people from the top But their hearts aren't ready For really what Allah has 
for them and wants them to do. So he saw Allah focused on the individuals. He focused on the individuals. So you have to become a good individual. And then if when there's enough good individuals, we return back to being a great nation. There's already greatness in the Ummah. We're still the greatest Ummah. But we can go back to having the real reasons behind why we got that title. Does that make sense? So then the question comes to mind, how does the individual become great? How does the individual become good? And how does the individual become evil? Of course, by enjoying good and forbidding evil. But there's something that comes before enjoining good and forbidding evil. And that thing that comes before enjoining good and forbidding evil is knowledge. The people of knowledge are the greatest individuals. They forbid the evil and enjoin the good based on the knowledge that they have. You can't even do enjoining good and forbidding evil without knowledge. You will only enjoin evil and forbid good if, you have, if you're ignorant and you don't have knowledge in the first place. So the knowledge is the first step. And we abandon enjoining good and forbidding evil because we abandoned knowledge. Look at what the Quran says about why people of knowledge are the best. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ladina amanu, the ones who have iman, wa amilu salihat, and they do righteous actions. Ula'ika hum khayrul bariya. They are the best. They are the best creatures. They are the best of all beings. As in, there's no one better than these guys, the ones who have iman and the ones who have righteous actions. Then in the next verse, Allah carried on explaining them. He said, What? They are the ones who fear Allah. So the best of all creation, the best of all creatures, the best of all beings are the ones who fear Allah. Who are the ones who fear Allah? Allah told you in the Quran, The best, the ones who fear Allah are the people of knowledge. The ulama, the scholars, the ones who have ilm, knowledge. So then in one verse, Allah Azza wa tells you the best of all beings are the ones who fear Allah. Another verse, Allah tells you the ones who fear Allah are the ones who have knowledge. So the ones who have knowledge are the best of all people. In fact, Allah Azza wa tells us in the Quran, the worst of all people, the worst of all beings in the sight of Allah Azza wa are the ones who don't understand, the ones who, don't, the ones who are jahil. Allah says, "Inna sharr al-dawab عند الله السم البكم الذين لا يعقلون." That the worst of all beings in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal are the ones who what are weak, deaf, dumb. They are blind. Sorry, uh, sorry, deaf and dumb. لا يعقلون. لا يعقلون. They don't understand. They are jahil. They are ignorant people. So then, knowledge makes you the best, and ignorance makes you the worst. The worst, the problems in the ummah come back to ignorance. In fact, what made the Prophet sallallahu alaihi different to us was the Prophet a human being, like we are human beings. Did he bleed like we bleed? Did he feel pain like we feel pain? Sallallahu alaihi Yes, he was similar to us in that he's a human being, but he was different as well. So, what made him different? Allah told him to in the Quran. Allah mentions. Allah told him to say, Qul, say Muhammad, say what? I am a human. I am a human. I am a human. I am a man. Mithlukum, just like you. We are humans. I am just like you. So then what's different between us and the Prophet? ﷺ? He carries on. I am a man just like you. But what's the difference? But revelation comes to me. Quran comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Sunnah that Allah Azza wa Jalla teaches him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam comes. So then he's a man just like us, but he has revelation. This revelation in another verse, Allah called it knowledge. When Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said, After that which came to you from knowledge, i.e. what came to the Prophet Sallallahu was revelation, Wahi, in another verse, Allah called that revelation that comes from knowledge. So then the Prophet Sallallahu is better than us. He's like us, as in he's human, but what makes him a better human than us and better than all the other humans and the greatest of them all is the knowledge that he possessed, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, in another hadith, he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, A'lu, A'lamukum billahi ana. I am the one who has the most knowledge of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala from all of you. So then he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because of his knowledge, 
if knowledge is what makes you the best, he has the most knowledge, so he is the best. My brothers and my sisters, this knowledge is what will return you back to what this ummah was meant to be. An ummah of greatness. And they always have khair in it. But we're in a day and an age where the ummah is not reaching its full potential. And it won't reach its potential through politics. It won't reach its potential through status and leadership. Don't let people fool you. The ummah will reach its potential through beneficial knowledge and righteous actions. The evidence of this, and I'll leave you inshallah ta'ala with this verse. Allah Azza wa Jal, He said, Allah is the one. He is the one who did what? Arsala Rasulahu bil Huda. He is the one who sent his messenger with guidance. The guidance is the Quran and Sunnah. Knowledge, knowledge. He's the one who sent it with knowledge. That's what the scholars they explained the guidance in this verse to mean beneficial knowledge. Because that guidance, how do you get it? You learn it. Knowledge. And he also sent the Prophet ﷺ with a religion of truth. The religion, when you manifest it, is righteous actions. The scholars, they explained, deen al-haq here to mean righteous actions. So then Allah is the one who sent his Prophet with beneficial knowledge to teach us, to guide us, and righteous actions so we can, we can implement and manifest the, the deen, which is haq, the religion of truth. Why? Why did Allah send the Prophet ﷺ with righteous actions and beneficial knowledge? So that Islam can become apparent, victorious, supreme over all other religions. But what if the people don't want Islam and they hate Islam? Even if they don't like it, even if the kuffar, the mushrikun, they hate it, it's still going to happen. If the Muslims come with beneficial knowledge, they learn, they study their deen, when they implement it, Islam is going to prevail over all other religions. So my brothers and sisters, seeking knowledge is the revival of this ummah. Now, we're going to stop and shut down break from Maghrib. I just want to take maybe another 30 seconds of your time because I will always feel like it will be a travesty to tell you to seek knowledge and not tell you where you can go and seek it. We currently at the Knowledge College are running a five years Islamic studies program. A five Islamic studies program. The link has just been sent into the chat. I'm sure you all can see it and I'd like you all to click on it. This five years Islamic studies program, it goes through a structured syllabus to teach you the most necessary things that you need to know at a basic level. And then each stage you advance and you progress to levels that are greater. This is revolutionary. The likes of what we're doing has not been seen at this scale in the West, or at least if it has been seen, it's rare, which is why many are, I mean, I personally haven't come across this. We, alhamdulillah, currently have hundreds of students that are on the program. Two classes that have already started, one in September and one in January. And now the third one is starting, inshallah ta'ala, right after Ramadan, immediately after Ramadan in May, where students are studying texts, classical texts. Classical texts. They, the, the, the beneficial knowledge, the, the pure knowledge, aqidah, fiqh, seer, hadith. They're learning it. They're passing it on to their family members. This is where the revival takes place. Did you guys know that there have never been as many students of knowledge, people seeking knowledge in the history of Islam as there are today? Did you know this? In terms of quantity, in terms of number, there are more people trying to study Islam today than ever before. Did you know this? There are more people today that are trying to study Islam than ever before in history. But never in history have the people of knowledge been so few. Back in the days, there weren't this many people seeking knowledge. But there were way more people of knowledge than there are today. Despite the small amount of seeking knowledge, the scholars are more. Today, the people seeking knowledge are more. But the people who actually get the knowledge, who actually say, hey, I actually learned, I've got it, are very few. 
One of the primary reasons for that is because number one, knowledge is a bit hard to access. Not everyone can go to Medina University. Not everyone can take time off to go to Egypt. Not everyone can go to you know, Pakistan and seek knowledge there. Not everyone can go back home to Somalia and seek knowledge with the scholars there. Not everyone can go back home and study. And even if they could go back home, there's a, there's a lot at stake. I mean, yeah, we, at the end of the day, we make excuses where there's a will, there's a way, but it's, it's not as accessible as it was before. The second thing is that those who do find access to knowledge, they don't follow a structured program. You may study for 20 years without a structured syllabus, and you, you'll just have ma'lumat, you'll know facts. This hadith, this book, this scholar, this principle here and there, but you won't really ha understand and have knowledge. Whereas a person who seeks knowledge for one year in a structured way, that's designed for a student which is a mubtadi, which is a beginner student. And that so he can build throughout the stages. After one year, he can be more, he can know more about the deen in terms of knowledge than a person who did it for 20 years without any structure, without an actual syllabus. Here we have a five-year program like that, my beloved brothers and sisters. Now, inshallah ta'ala, I would urge you to click the link and register. Um, I don't have to, you know, give this a hard push. Uh, it's not like, uh, you know, like force you and come across like I'm doing a hard promotion or something like that. Someone signed up, alhamdulillah. What's the name of the person who signed up? Let's give them a shout out. But I don't want to come across like that. You know, knowledge is something that if you want it, I don't have to beg you to take knowledge. If you want it, knowledge is too great for you it to be belittled. And me to have to force you and sign up, register, and seek knowledge. You shouldn't have to do that. You either want it, then that's good for you. If you don't want it, Qadr Allah, 